picking up where I left off in the last episode and especially now that you are a bit acquainted with the main technical terms and names of some of the most crucial pieces of hardware or gear inside of a recording studio, you are ready for the next step. Have you ever wondered how recording for CU or 2D music works? What is the work that CU have to put when they are singers, songwriters and want to have a say in what their music sounds like? Or how recording for 2D music projects works? Especially when there are franchises like Ensemble Stars and Idol Master Saidem that have casts with over 40 members. This is the episode for you and I will be guiding you through recordings of CU music. So let's kick off this episode of CU Lounge. Welcome to CU Lounge. I am your host Vanessa and today's topic is recording CU music with particular emphasis on the recording sessions for 2D music projects, solo artists and bands. In this episode you and I will continue our journey through a recording studio and you will get to learn a little bit about how recordings for solo music projects work as well as for 2D music projects and bands. For this episode I will put all my experience in the music industry, also as a former music producer and composer, alongside the information that I have been compiling over a decade about music production for 2D music groups and solo artists from CU and music magazines, variety, radio and TV appearances. For purposes of this episode you will find yourself in three different situations which I will mention when they change for you. Just for you to understand what is going to happen. This episode is split into 2D music projects, solo artists and bands. For each of these three parts you are going to be a CU that is in that specific situation, which means part of a 2D group, a solo artist, and a band member, in this case a frontman for a rock band. Why this division in three sections? Recordings for each are different and some do not have a creative process section for the CU to partake in. At the same time, it is clearer for you to understand how each recording works. Let's talk about recording for 2D music projects. By now, especially if you have been following Seiyu Lounge's episodes, you know about 2D music projects. How those can help boost the popularity of a Seiyu, or even be a ladder for other projects and, who knows, even a solo debut. 2D music projects have been around since the past decade, at least with more intensity. 2D groups go back to the 90s with EMU and, in a way, Weisskreutz paving the way. Utapri was the gateway for that boom. And in 2017, Quartet Night and Trigger broke the barriers in the industry for other groups and projects to find their fortune and fame. Since 2010, hundreds of 2D music projects have been launched, some better known than others, some with better quality than others, but the wide majority exploring one common music genre, pop. Idols are a big thing in Japan, basically in all of Asia, and for anime audiences to engage and being invested in music anime, producers found that idol anime or music anime with idols is what sells best. Honestly, I feel like idol anime is a one-trick pony that always follows the same recipe either a reverse harem or just bromance all the way. Music is important to be catchy, not to be necessarily good. And the plot is usually missing in action. It entertains, but usually beyond that has little substance. There are exceptions though. 
Idolish 7 comes across as one of the most refreshing takes on music anime featuring idols. Since I already talked plenty about the project in previous episodes, I won't dive again into it. So let's kick off our little exercise. Remember, you are a CU part of a 2D idol group. Your manager comes to pick you up because today you do have a recording scheduled for a 2D idol group you've just been casted in. The group has five members, including yourself, and they are, of course, a pop outfit because, remember, pop music sells better than any other music genre. You arrive at the studio and are greeted by the producer and sound engineers. They ask you if you are okay with the song. Yes, I forgot to tell you, but before going for recording, you receive in advance the demo song with guide vocals on it and the lyrics to practice. The demo is basically a simple, non-final version of the song that is used just for you to have a feel of how the song is expected to flow. It has been previously tracked, but it is not the final mix nor the mastered version. In simple terms, a demo is a non-final, unpolished version of the instrumental. Guide vocals are also on it. Usually the composer may hum how they'd like the parts in the melody to go, or the lyricist may sing the lyrics for you in the tone and at the tempo they intend for you to sing. The guide vocals aren't necessarily on key, they are just there to, once again, give you a sense of how you'll have to perform the song. In case the song was purchased from a music bank, which basically may include instrumentals that are licensed and available for purchase by anyone, anywhere, those come with guide vocals in the language that the song was originally written in. This is not common in 2D music projects, as songs tend to be crafted by Japanese composers, lyricists and arrangers. An interesting fact, Mikoto, Marginal No. 4's composer, not only sings the guides for the voice actors, but he also leaves his vocals from the guides as backing vocals on all of Marginal No. 4's songs. Yeah, you can go back to Marginal No. 4's songs and you'll now notice his vocals in the background, out in the open when those were allegedly covered well by Ken and Yutu Suzuki's vocals the two voice actors to whom Mikoto has the closest singing tone. That's a weird fact, but composers love to leave their mark in whatever they have their hands on, and this is Mikoto's way of saying, I was here. Now back to the studio. The producer, a sound engineer, and eventually the composer will be in the studio with you, and you can ask any questions and look for guidance during your performance. After receiving their pointers and tips, you warm up your voice, do some stretches, relax your shoulders and gargle some water. You enter the recording booth and close the door behind you. You notice that the sound that you make inside, it is now muffled. That is a result mix of acoustics and sound isolation of the said room. You have a condenser mic, a lyric stand, professional-grade headphones and a mini console in which you can control the volume of the instrumental going through the headphones to you. You put on the headphones, check the levels of the audio, clamp the lyrics on the stand and relax your neck. You are ready to go and signal the producer through the window to the main room. The music starts. And you're ready to go for a dry take of the song. A rehearsal. No straining. Not full power, just to get a feel of what the song, that now should be a final version including other vocals that may have been recorded prior to your session, sounds like. You will get some tips and instructions during recording of the various parts you will be performing. This can be a lot of help, especially if you're struggling with something or if the producers want something a bit different from you. 
the producer comes to you and mentions that you are actually the third person in the group to record vocals for this song. So while you're listening to it and actively waiting for your parts, you get to listen to those vocals that are already in the mix. Interesting, isn't it? So the question is, who goes first in the recording booth? And why is that so important? These might seem like weird questions, but it actually dictates the flow of the recording and the tone of the song, even if that Seiyu's voice is not the center for that specific song. For example, for Trigger's songs, Wataru Hatanu and Soma Saito mention that Takuya Sato always records first, with Hatano following and Saito wrapping up because he's the one with the most packed schedule, having odd recording times. Takuya Sato is the only true baritone among two versatile tenors with different ranges. It actually ends up being a safe choice to make the odd voice, and I mean odd as the one that is vastly different in range from all others in the group, to go first so that the tenors can work on top of that voice or around it if they are not at center for that song. In case you haven't noticed, Trigger's performances usually sound robust and consistent due to how good the foundation are Sato's vocals. Props to him because his voice, singing tone and technique are pure quality. Trigger are actually a pretty interesting case because even if the members are part of a 2D music project, Hatano, Saito and Sato work as if they are a real group that exists outside of that project. They discuss how they want to perform their songs prior to the recordings, their harmonies and everything between members. Not many 2D groups can say that they are organized and all in the same page when it comes to taking the 2D group one step further. But the way they approach the 2D group they are a part of is not the norm. Most 2D groups have their members going one by one to record, not sharing impressions between them, nor coordinating between themselves what they want to do. Each seiyu just arrives, records their parts, and off they go to their next job. Also, some 2D groups usually have their center go in first to record, with other members taking turns, mostly when they can fit the recording in their schedules. In case of all-star group songs, it is the same. For example, if the whole cast of Ensemble Stars Idol Master Saidem, Hypnosis Mike, or any other project that features a big lineup and have to record an all star song, it might work in one of two ways. Either each member comes in to record their individual part, which takes a long time, or each group comes together to perform their group and individual parts, which is a bit faster. Either way, have in mind. Recording for a 3-minute song can take as much as 3 hours to wrap up. And I am not adding mixing and mastering to this, which takes even longer. With several members coming in to record their parts in a song, usually their character's part and the chorus, those 3 hours can take much longer and extend for several days. What do you have to record if you're a part of a 2D music project? Your character's parts in the verses and the chorus. That's usually it, you don't sing the whole song. The more people in a group, the less time you'll have to perform, that is, unless the group does not have equal lines distribution, and you actually end up hogging all the spotlight from your peers. A note. When Soara debuted, the group did not have equal lines distribution. Toshiki Toyonaga and Yuki Ono were visibly the ones to perform 70% or more of the song, while Makoto Furukawa, Chiharu Sawashiro and Taishi Murata barely sang. Zul wore the exact same thing. Their debut single, Poisonous Gangster, 
features Kotaro Nishiyama and Takashi Kondo in the background and only in the chorus. The line's distribution was pretty much 98% for Yuya Hirose and Subaru Kimura. Things have changed for both groups though. And character songs. For character songs, Seiyu usually perform the whole song in a session, which means the chorus, main melody and the harmony. In simple terms, the chorus is the part that repeats itself twice or thrice in a song. Then we have the verses, pre-chorus, bridge and outro. In a traditional pop format, a song contains two verses. Pre-chorus appears one or two times in a song, depending on the length of the song, because as you may know, songs do have a bridge section. The bridge is usually only an instrumental part, including a solo by an instrument or instruments, or ends up being a part in which you can fit a dance break and the sort made for the live performance. The bridge might not necessarily replace a pre-chorus, but there are times in which it does, changing how the last chorus and outro sound. Recording for solo artists. Now, this is where things are usually simpler. If you have any knowledge about how musicians record their music, it really applies in here just like that. Either way, since some of you might not be familiar with how recordings work for solo artists, and others might have not heard the previous episode of Seiyu Lounge, I will dive a bit into it. For purposes of this section, you are a Seiyu that has a career as a solo artist. One thing that, at the start, can change everything is whether you're a singer-songwriter, just like Toshiki Toyonaga and Soma Saito, or just a performer like Mamoru Mieno and Daisuke Ono. What differs? Singer-songwriters usually record their own demos. They also craft their own lyrics. They head into the studio firstly to create the music, record any instruments they play, and then to record their vocals. There is a whole creative process that a singer-songwriter has to go through. Firstly, unless you are Toshiki Toyonaga, that is also his own producer and arranger, you will have to run through your ideas with the producer and arranger that can take your demo and create what you envisioned or expand upon what you already have by using their composition and arrangement skills. They help give life to your ideas, polishing your demos. You still get credited as the sole composer for that song, because you are. But they will be credited as the arrangers for it, as they really fleshed out your demo from a simple acoustic guitar tune with a beat underneath, to a full-on orchestral rock song, for example. Time spent in the studio may be much more than those say you that are just performers, as you will be present for music composition and arrangement, for the recording sessions of the instruments, to monitor how everything is shaping up, to record as well your vocals and sometimes even for mixing and mastering. Singer-songwriters are on top of what is being done. They are an active part in the creative process and if they have total creative freedom, singer-songwriters are the bosses inside of the studio. The producing team, arrangers included, as well as the session musicians, which are the musicians that were hired to play the instruments that you can't play, are all led by you as you try to achieve the sound you envisioned while composing your song. Now, if you're just a performer, you may still hint at your producer, arranger or music label that you want songs following a certain theme or themes and they will craft or acquire songs for you that respect those wishes. The song and lyrics are already made prior to you entering the studio, you just have to understand those and grasp those emotions and perform them. Either way, you receive a demo. The guide vocals and lyrics and you will get acquainted with that song before heading to the recording. 
you only know how the song will really sound like when you arrive at the studio and listen to a more polished version of it. Remember, this is not the final mastered version of the song, just a mix of it. Say you that our performers have little to no input in their music, as they did not have a hand in the composition or lyrics, nor the arrangements, so while they can still give their impressions, usually it is set in stone that the song will be performed in a certain way and in a certain tone, and it will have a specific sound that you cannot choose. In both cases, the singer-songwriters and the performers say you will have to perform the main melody, harmony, and only after that they will tackle the chorus. The harmony consists on recording the same parts in different keys. It might be useful to use higher key vocals as background vocals or used as an accent to give depth to a performance, for example. The chorus is usually the last thing to track because it has to fit within the song and given how it is going to repeat itself at least two times and it has to be intense, that intensity has to, once more, not be over the top and fit with the song. Of course, that intensity, at least in the instrumental, can be enhanced during mixing. Vocals not so much, so you need to make sure that you have nailed those. Also, how the rest of the song was recorded usually influences how the chorus ends up sounding in the end. Interesting notes, recording for each song takes up to 3 hours. So a single takes roughly 9 hours to record, as it includes usually 3 songs. A mini album or EP takes 15 hours to record, and a full-length album with 12 songs takes roughly 36 hours to record. Recording sessions may be spread across several days to avoid straining your voice. And don't forget, mixing and mastering also take quite a while. Usually, between the album's production and its release, there are one to one and a half months of difference. The complete production of a full-length album usually takes between one month and two months in total. Almost everything I mentioned in this section applies with necessary adaptations for duos or trios. Examples include You Make as the self-producing group and Trignal as the performers. Recording for bands Recordings for bands have a different dynamic. Band members may record together in the same room or they may even record solo. Sometimes there are not even demos crafted when the band enters a studio. Perhaps there are lyrics and some rough ideas on piano and guitar, usually the two instruments in which you compose music, but never full-on demos. Being a part of a band like Gran Rodeo or Old Codex, for example, involves a different type of commitment. The band enters the studio together with scraps of ideas and works on those together, composing songs and writing lyrics while working inside of the studio. Once those are set in stone, the band starts their recording sessions. Some rock bands prefer to have all instruments recording at the same time in the main recording room. It has that live performance dynamic, but it may not work well in some bands because even if each instrument is tracked to a different knob on the mixing table and recordings between instruments do not overlap, all other musicians recording at that time have monitor headphones on them and are listening to what others are playing. Less experienced members or session musicians called to join in the band in the studio recordings might not have the comfort of playing together with the band and actually prefer to record their parts isolated. 
In that case, bands record each instrument on its own and slowly add those in the digital audio workstation software. In other cases, bands record together without the vocalist as if it is a jam session. But for that to happen, the band must be in the same groove, meaning that they are not prone to making mistakes when playing music. Recording together often leads to the creation of really cool songs. Vocals are usually recorded last. Actually, this makes a lot of sense. Sometimes the most minimal change in an instrumental can completely mess up the dynamics in the vocals, so you want to avoid that and instead you only record vocals when the songs are completed. Once again, if the bands have complete creative freedom, they will accompany and be active in all parts of the composition, arrangement, recording, mixing and mastering. Sometimes their own members do most, if not all of that, which makes the release they are recording all the more personal. Time inside of the studio is quite a lot for self-producing bands or bands with singer-songwriters in their ranks. Same thing applies from solo artists in terms of what parts are performed, harmony, chorus, main melody, as well as the recording times for one song, a single, an EP and a full-length album. And with these you have bases about music production and recording sessions for music by solo artists, bands, units and 2D projects. That is the end of the exercise for you, thank you for your participation. There is a lot of work that goes into it. That is why I mentioned on episodes 2 and 11 of CU Lounge that I think that CU shouldn't just kick off a career in the music industry just because. Some are doing it because it is a trend, others are doing it because their talent agencies push them to do it. Others genuinely do it, but those are a minority. Being a musician or a singer takes a lot of effort and dedication. Regardless if it is a 2D music project or their own project, regardless if they are singer-songwriters or just performers. If say you are everywhere, you can already tell that it is difficult to, between anime, drama CD, narration and games recordings, plus public appearances, magazine interviews and social gatherings, for say you to focus 100% on each of those things. That's why the weird obsession of some say you to be everywhere often leads to some of those projects to suffer in the process. But I won't dive more into it as I already gave you my peace of mind on episodes 2 and 11 of CU Lounge. Hope this episode makes you look at music with different eyes as well as to the work CU do in the studio when recording music for your favorite projects or even for their own thing as solo artists, CU unit members or frontmen in their own bands. Respect the performers, massive respect for singer-songwriters, solo and bands, and most of all, insane respect for all CU that venture into the music industry in the most varied ways and are passionate about it. I could keep going on and on about music recordings. As you noticed, for solo artists and bands, recordings are not really different from what musicians all over the world do. Now, when it comes to 2D groups, the dynamic is usually closest to how real idol groups record songs. There are so many things going on in those recordings that usually people don't take into account when listening to those songs. Many just think that say you just go to the studio, learn the song on the spot, record and off they go, when there's actually a lot of hard work in the mix. So tell me, were you aware how music recordings work? 
Did you know about all the preparation that you undergo before music recording? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this episode and don't want to miss the Hand That Feeds HQ's weekly mail CU and music related content, hit the subscribe button. I'll return next week with another episode of CU Lounge. Thank you for listening and see you guys around.